Hi everyone, thanks for listening and welcome to another episode of Drone Chat, brought to you by Safe Droning Australia, your online safety equipment store. Find us at safedroningaustralia.com.au. This episode features Jerry Grayson, who was just 17 years old when he joined the Fleet Air Arm, becoming the youngest helicopter pilot to ever serve in the Royal Navy. By the age of 25, he was the most decorated peacetime naval pilot in history, being awarded the Air Force Cross by Her Majesty the Queen for outstanding gallantry in search and rescue. Since leaving the Royal Navy, Jerry has carved out a career becoming one of the top five helicopter film pilots in the world and the world's leading aerial film director and has now embraced the world of UAVs. So here's Jerry. So how are you today, Jerry? Good, good. Looking forward to a chat. Jerry, what was it like being a rescue pilot in the Royal British Navy? Yeah, um, it was the thing that really I was aiming at all the way through my, my naval career. Uh, I started out doing um, anti-submarine work uh, using the Sea Kings, um, but search and rescue is what I really wanted to get to uh, achieve because, you know, it's a bit odd spending your life uh, training to do something that you hope will never happen, i.e. war. Um, and therefore, using the same skills but in a different direction, and you know, saving life rather than taking life, um, seemed to me to be a, a a job worth doing. And um, so, yeah, I kind of aimed my my flying in that direction, uh, and uh, ultimately achieved it, and spent uh, about three and a half years flying uh, what we call SAR, um, and uh, and loved every moment of it. Okay, so how and why did you progress from from that into films and camera work? Yeah, well, it was actually a natural progression. Um, in the last six months of my time uh, on Search and Rescue, uh, the BBC did a uh, what was then a very new thing. I think it was only the second time they'd done a fly-on-the-wall documentary. And for that, they um, they embedded a, a, a small um, crew with us. There was a, a producer, a stroke interviewer, a cameraman and a sound man. And they basically lived with us for about six months. Um, and they would come on our training and they would come on the, you know, the actual missions. So um, there were two results of that. One is that... Um, I have a lovely record of, uh, of of my time from many years ago and uh, uh, and, and various incidents. Um, and uh, and the other thing is that you know when we were just doing practicing um, outside of the the real rescues, uh, they would say, okay, so we we need to, for example, do an introduction in, introduction to the series. Um, so we went and put a presenter, winched him down onto a. Uh, a rock and uh, and hovered very close to him, um, filming him doing lip sync, and uh, and then pulled away to show the fact that he was on a rock. And so I started to um, get a bit of training from those guys into uh, how uh, any piece of TV production is put together, um, and uh, and how one shot would lead to another shot in the in the editing suite. Um, and consequently how you would fly it. So, um, you know, I had sort of six months training at the, at the end of the Navy time, which was, had been a total of eight years, um, and uh, I had already uh, started to um, put together a, a, a helicopter company um, down in the same sort of area, down in Cornwall in the southwest of the UK. And um, it happened that, you know, that is a very beautiful area, uh, and a lot of um, TV dramas, uh, movies and uh, TV commercials, all sorts of filming um, takes place down in Cornwall because it's well away from uh, from the big population areas. It's got great cliffs, great seascapes, um, great landscapes. Um, and so uh, around the time that I was leaving, we started to um, get inquiries for, for film work and, and one thing led to another. Uh, until we had several 
local productions under our belt um, uh, of production companies coming down to Cornwall to film their stuff, uh, who then said, OK, we liked working with you. You know, can you come up and uh, bring a helicopter and um, do some work around London or up in the, you know, the northern England or whatever? Uh, and gradually, gradually further and further afield until we were um, doing a lot of um, uh, international productions as well. Um, so it was a, a, a kind of a evolution rather than by design, to be honest. OK. So you've worked on a few movies over the years. What, what are some of the movies you've worked on? Oh, the big, the, the big ones really were my, my first and my last, which uh, the first was um, certainly a baptism by fire. Um, was working on the James Bond movie, uh, A View to a Kill. Um, so, you know, one uh, becomes aware fairly early on that... Um, uh, you better have your act together when the when the director says, "Okay, let's have the helicopter now." Um, and uh, uh, and the last one I did, um, it's a while ago now, but uh, was um, a Black Hawk Down uh, for Ridley Scott, uh, which we filmed um, out in uh, Morocco. And uh, those were the the biggest. But along the way, lots of other stuff, um, some of which you might have heard of, and, and some of which you almost certainly haven't. <laughs> um, I think um, uh, yeah, f- favourites hard to uh, hard to answer that. I suppose you know those two big ones from the point of view of being exposed to what a you know a film crew of three thousand looks like. Um, three thousand. Yeah, yeah, that, and that was that, that was on uh, Black Hawk Down, and that was just in the uh, European feeding tent. Um, the uh, the locals consisted of uh, half of, of Rabat, which is the the capital of Morocco, literally. Um, and uh, so you know that that for the sheer scale of it, and also uh, I have loved uh, each time I've worked with significant directors, and I, you know I tend to interact more with uh, film directors rather than actors. Um, uh, and seeing how somebody like Ridley Scott works, so. You know, he is a uh, a consummate um, artist with the storyboards. And you would find that, you know, when everybody went for lunch, he would be sitting there quietly drawing what he thought was uh, perhaps an, a nice change to uh, what we were going to film in the afternoon. And everybody would come back from uh, from lunch and, uh, and he'd just sort of quietly hand the new storyboard to his assistant director, who would then have to organize things rapidly and we'd uh, you know change what we're doing in order to accommodate his new ideas and and those you know those sort of experiences of, of watching real craftsmen like that at work has been invaluable um to me throughout the rest of my, my flying filming career okay so you mentioned that you perhaps didn't get close into reaction with 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 actors were, were there any that you did that that you enjoyed working with in particular Oh yeah, I'm uh, been very privileged along the way. The, uh, again, the first one uh, I suppose stands out for me being uh, View to a Kill with Roger Moore. Got to spend a bit of time with him, and um, in fact, there's uh, an amusing story there because. Uh, oh, do I don't, tell, do tell. Yeah, I, I don't know if you remember the uh, uh, the sequence in there with um, uh, Grace Jones as as the baddie, and and she redeems herself at the end by. Uh, uh, coming out of a mine on a little um, hand-propelled rail cart, yeah. uh, it's got the bomb on it, and it, and it, and it uh, therefore goes off uh, outside the mine rather than inside, and yep. therefore doesn't set off the um, uh, San Francisco's uh, fault line. Um, and uh, so, anyway, the the, uh, the 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 cameraman, who was the guy who had actually got me onto the job in the first place, a chap called Peter Allwork, who was. Um, if you if you look at any aerial sequences in movies from about 1960 through to 1990, um, he he was the guy, um, and we worked together on on something else. I can't remember what it was now, but he he he, he liked working together and and invited me to do this. Anyway, he uh, as Grace Jones is about to come out of the out of the mine on her little rail cart. Um, He's going, OK, closer, Jerry, just a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And in the end, I, I, I flew slightly too close because it oh ended my. up blowing uh, 
uh, dust and rocks in her direction and she was coughing and spluttering and wiping her eyes and she was notorious at that time because about six months earlier she'd actually punched an interviewer on BBC um, for saying the wrong thing she was a very very fiery character and um, so uh, <clears throat> once we'd uh, successfully got that take but um, uh, blown stuff into her face the director called me on the radio and he said um, do you, uh, do you need fuel, Jerry? And I said, no, no I'm, I'm fine, Governor. I've got about another hour on board. He said, I'll tell you what, go and get fuel and take about three hours doing it and, and come back when you, <laughs> when she's calmed down. So um, uh, I, I did indeed do that. I managed to avoid her for the rest of the, of the shoot. But the next day, the director, John Glenn, um, very kindly invited me in to watch the rushes, which is you know where they have printed up the film and and he checks through that he's got everything from the day before that he needs. Yeah. So there's him, me, and Roger Moore in there, and uh, um, uh, and we came to that sequence, which of course showed all of the um, blowing the dust into her eyes. And Roger Moore turned to me and and said nothing. He just did that wonderful um, thing for which he was so famous of raising one eyebrow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so within that, within that one movement of the eyebrow, it said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <clears throat> that's one uh, thing I guess to see it in a movie, but to have it experienced yeah. it personally, that that's mm. <laughs> absolutely. And he he was real, you know, a real gentleman. He he came across in person exactly the way that he always was on the screen, um, and similarly. Um, uh, the, my other favourite was was uh, a, a movie or long forgotten, but it's, it was called Water, and it was about uh, it was a comedy about a, a Caribbean island under a British protectorate and the sort of lunatics who who were on this little island. Um, and uh, the stars of that were uh, Michael Caine and uh, Billy Connolly. And um, I had the pleasure of having lunch with them on the. Um, a sunny day out on uh, a grassy slope in front of the catering wagon one day. And um, those two uh, bantering together, it was exactly, again, as you see them on the screen. I mean, gen genuine characters and probably the funniest lunch I've ever had. <clears throat> wow. Having lunch with Billy and Michael. Yeah. So you're mixing <laughs> the right circles. Uh, no, I felt I, I have been very, very privileged to, to find myself in some wonderful places with some amazing people. Lucky, lucky yeah. situation to be in. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, the Olympics of the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. You've been involved with the telecasts on those. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it was uh, uh, the first one was the, the Athens Olympics. Um, and went on to be a whole series of events of, of the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, um, the Asian Games in Qatar, uh, and Soccer World Cup in uh, in South Africa. Um, and uh, but the Olympics were the first, and uh, uh, my producer, who then became my wife, Sarah, um, uh, announced one day in about uh, 2000, I think it was, 2001 perhaps, she said, I think I'm going to try and get us the gig of the Olympics. And I said, Phew, good luck with that. Um, and I had uh, I, I had flown the Winter Olympics in Sarajevo um, back in the 80s, um, but I really thought she'd bitten off more than she could chew there. But uh, in the end, she succeeded, and, and we were the, um, the first... Uh, and I think only time that um, the whole gig has ever been uh, given uh, to one company to do all of the uh, aerial broadcast side of things. Um, so we did uh, all of the outside sports, you know, the, the running, the cycling, um, the sailing. Uh, I mean, the sailing alone took three helicopters for the, the whole period. So we, we flew uh, 10 helicopters down to, uh, down to Greece. Um, they'd awarded us the contract, uh, oh, I think it was about four months before uh, the event, and we normally reckon on two years of planning. So it was a, a huge exercise to, to, to get it underway. And, and in the end, we had to rely on both the machinery and the people, and the only way we could really do that was to um, get guys that we already uh, knew uh, and uh, and that meant out of the UK, 
Um, so I had a squadron of 10 helicopters fly down from um, uh, from the UK to Athens, which was a three-day trip for them. And uh, the, when you get into that sort of scale, um, it really is all in the planning. And uh, for example, just getting them down there, we realized that uh, if 10 helicopters arrive at the same time at a you know, little French airfield when they're having lunch, you're not gonna get very much fuel out of them. Um, and even if they were uh, alert, uh, it was gonna take a long time to fuel 10. So we, we split them up into um, three flights of uh, um, two threes and one four uh, and, uh, and went about it that way. But th those are the sort of things where you know, in that planning time, you're looking into all of the dark corners and going, where are we potentially going to trip up here, um, and uh, and finding solutions for it. So that was a, uh, you know, to do the Olympics with ten helicopters, they don't. Uh, you can't sort of put your hand up and go, uh, could we just delay the start of the marathon because I'm not quite ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and you only had, as you said, four months to yeah. to get pull all that together. Yeah, it was it was interesting because it was, you know, I mean, by then we had we had got used to the internet, but it wasn't a a, a massive thing in in sort of two thousand what was it two thousand and four? I suppose it was, you know, we were using it, but it wasn't second nature. Um, and the interesting thing was that because we had. Uh, moved to Australia from the UK in 2002. Um, you know, we were full residents by then. Um, and we found that we could achieve it in that time scale, not in spite of being in Australia, but because we were. Uh, and this is because we were on a, uh, a 12 hour about um, time zone with the UK. So we could work a full 12 hour day here uh, and then bang off a long detailed email to our partners in the UK and uh, and we'd go to bed and they'd work on it for 12 hours and then hand it back to us. So we were achieving a, a genuine 24-7 during the planning purposes um, and, uh, and, and that was uh, really how we achieved it, um, not in spite of being in Australia. So I guess you, you would also say that um, if Sarah's involved, you just sort of go, well, it's going to happen. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I I long ago learned to do exactly that. <laughs> uh, so, with all this experience with helicopters uh, and now becoming a bit of an expert when it comes to, you know, filming and getting the right angle, yep. what what role do you see UAV and drones playing in in that field? Oh, it's enormous. I mean, just uh, not only replacing helicopters in in uh, in many cases, um, other than perhaps the long distance stuff. And I would say that you know helicopters always are, are going to be the solution then, because you actually do need a person's eyes at the location. Yes. Um, but a, a, apart from that. Um, they're not only taking all the helicopter work, but they are also taking over from, you know, cranes and, and, and other ways of doing it, um, making it more efficient, not necessarily much cheaper. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, in the early days, people expected to uh, hire in a drone crew and get it for a tenth of the price of a helicopter crew, but it, it really doesn't work out that way. Um, but because it was uh, quicker to achieve, uh, more flexible um, and could replace more than just the helicopter and the crane. It actually introduced um, methods of capturing imagery that that hadn't been available to us before. And, uh, you know, it starts with um, uh, something as, uh, as simple as the fact that if I was, you know, filming people in a swimming pool, I'd be I'd be blowing the umbrellas into the pool with them. But with a drone, of course, you can fairly unobtrusively um, do that from pretty much a you know a, 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 a face shot, a, a close up, and then pull back and through the trees, and suddenly it's become an aerial. And you know, I would love to have been able to do that with with helicopters but it just wasn't physically possible so it, it has introduced a whole range of filming techniques that weren't there before and for me it's like 
oh wow you know just at the time that i'm thinking i'm uh, getting a bit past it actually here's a whole fresh sheet of paper that opens up uh, and a whole fresh set of tools that we didn't have available to us before okay so you obviously fly drones as well yeah i mean i i i recognize that my whole being up to this point has been about feeling the flying machine through my bottom um uh, and you know here is a whole other technique um i still have most of my reactions but i but i haven't been brought up in the uh in the same way as the the youngsters these days where they don't actually have to learn to fly a drone they uh, um there are a lot of things they do need to know about like the safety side of things and the regulations and so on and they need to be taught how to um take those things seriously but as far as flying the drone and getting the best out of it that's something they almost take to naturally and inherently so um i i it, i actually prefer to be standing at their shoulder and uh, and helping them achieve that rather than necessarily using my own fingers and thumbs to achieve it i mean yeah i love i love doing that um always uh once once an aviator always an aviator i guess um but uh, but helping the um the new generation find careers uh, and particularly achieve film work um using these uh, the these new uh, uh, tools in the toolbox um that's where my greatest satisfaction comes from just on that talking about uh aviators it it's something that i uh, I've I've been fortunate to hear you speak a, a couple of times at, at um, like the Avalon Air Show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and apart from the fact that it's, oh, I can easily tell you've got a, a real passion for for this whole industry, whether it be film or whether it be drones or helicopters. Yeah. But there's something I picked up from you in, in Avalon, and that is that. <clears throat> You you have to me have the right view to it all, and that is that whether you're a helicopter pilot or whether you're a drone pilot, you are an aviator. Yes, and I think I think that's important that those of us who are venturing into this this new field of learning to fly a, a remote controlled machine that we've got to think of it not just as that's what we're doing. We've got to think that we are an aviator and we are sharing the space with the traditional aviators, as it were. That is exactly right, yeah. No, I mean, you, you, you've probably heard me say that, uh, you know, e e even... Uh even when teaching farmers how to how to use a drone in in the, its simplest uh, um, guise, as uh, you know, perhaps checking their crops or or just seeing whether all the gates are shut or whether the the uh, uh, watering holes are all working, um, you know, all of the the, the things that uh, that you can do yourself rather than having to hire somebody in to to do it, um, then I think that. Uh, the most important thing that I say is the first sentence, which is whether you like it or not, uh, you just became an aviator. Uh, and th the reason that you have to take it as seriously as that is that you are sharing the, the same medium, um, the airspace, uh, with the likes of, uh, of me and my compatriots in, in manned aviation. Now, I guess it's akin to, um, you know, taking a bicycle on the on the main road and and, and interacting with, uh, you know, cars and trucks and buses and all the rest of it. And nobody is going to expect you as a as a as a cyclist to need the same qualifications or the uh, or the same knowledge as as a bus driver. Um, but you sure as hell better be aware that the bus driver's there. And also be aware of what his problems are and what what his perspective is. Uh, one of the uh, one of the little tricks I love using in in my talks is is you know to if if I'm sitting opposite you and I write down uh, the figure six, uh, you will see the figure nine, and um, we will both be one hundred percent right. Although one of us sees six and one of us sees nine, you know that's what perspective is all about, and that is where. 
currently there is a there is a conflict going on between unmanned and manned aviation that we need to work through and and, and get right because it's not like uh, drones UAVs are going to go away. No, no. If anything, they're probably going to slowly but surely enhance, not necessarily take over, but enhance roles of manned aircraft. Yeah, uh, definitely enhance, um, and in many cases, sorry to say it, but uh, you know, take over. I there, there's a there's a um, a forum on online for uh, professional pilots, and uh, and most professional pilots in the world contribute to that albeit in in various categories and in the um in the rotary helicopter uh, category i posted a question a few weeks ago going uh, okay so uh, which of you are doing a job in a helicopter uh that you don't think could be taken over by a drone within the next five years and there were very very few uh, and, and even the ones that some people came out with where you could go, mm, maybe, yeah, maybe that's better done by a manned uh, machine. But uh, it, in in 99% of the cases, you'd have to conclude that it could be done as well as and perhaps better than a drone. So I think the, the expression, um, you know, take over those jobs is, is, is not invalid. Okay. So as as a pilot... Yeah, in a helicopter. Mm-hmm. What's been your scariest moment in the seat? Um, the scariest are where you do something stupid and you get away with it because that leaves a you know cold fingers down your neck going. Phew, that was close. That was you know too. That that was too easy to get myself into trouble there. Um, but probably. The big one was was really not my fault at all, which was a, uh, a tail rotor drive shaft shearing as a result of a metallurgical fracture during uh, manufacturing. Um, sheared. And, yeah, so you, you lose the uh, the drive to the tail rotor, um, and that, that causes you huge problems. It does a little bit. Uh, yeah, the, it, it depends what phase of flight you're in. Uh, the majority of people expire as a result of doing that. I'm glad you uh, didn't, Jerry. No, I'm glad I didn't too. But it was uh, a fairly close run thing. Uh, I, I was lucky to be in the in in the forward cruise, so a lot of airflow over the tail. Um, but it still flies, you know, almost sideways, and I had to work out how to get it on the ground like that. Um, I had another helicopter come and join me as i was approaching uh, uh, an airport um had to go to an airport so they could uh, provide enough foam um for whatever was the the you know potential end scenario and uh this other helicopter was saying yeah okay your your your, your tail is still intact uh, but the 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 tail rotor is not going round uh, and he stayed in formation with me um, right up till the last mile of approach to the runway, and uh, uh, and uh, he then peeled away and and just you know pressed the transmit button and just said good luck, uh, and and that was the moment when I went gulp yeah, I I know that the last five who've attempted this have all been fatal, um, so uh, you know the next couple of minutes are going to be a bit significant for me and I think that that was the uh, the scariest one I, I, I did get it down on the ground it had to be running at about 60 knots as we as we touched the runway um, it went up on one one wheel um, and sort of just teetered there and then came back down onto the other and uh, rolled it to a stop on the brakes and um, by that stage all of the uh, all, all of the fire services were there next to us and uh, I got out. To, uh, we, we, there was myself, a, a cameraman, and a, and a film producer. Um, we'd been off filming in the mountains for for the day before, and uh, we got out and found that actually our legs didn't work anymore. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> was so, that the only thing you found? Yeah, <laughs> thankfully yes. Um, but I mean, been totally focused up to that point, and then, and then uh, went okay. We better just sit here on the tarmac for a minute or two. And uh, the, the chief fireman of Teesside Airport um, came up to me and, and, and he said, are you guys okay? I said, yeah, yeah, we're fine. I said, look, 
I know we're in the middle of an active international airport and all that kind of thing, but I'm just going to have a cigarette if that's right with you. He said, you go right ahead, mate. <laughs> so uh, there's not many people have a cigarette in the middle of an active runway, but I, I do make that claim. <laughs> well, I suppose the good thing was that there was someone handy to help you put it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you've written these couple of books, uh, one of which I'm reading at the moment, Film Pilot. Oh, and, good. I hope you're enjoying it. Oh, I am. It, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It, it made me want to talk to you even more. Oh, uh, thank you. And, and, you, and you've also got another book called Rescue Pilot, which I think I'm going to have to get and read next. Um, is there any more books in Jerry? Is there a secret desire to tell an untold story that you haven't told so far that, that you want to tell, you've just got to pluck up the courage for it? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, the funny side of that is that when, uh, when I launched... Uh, uh, film pilot somebody asked me that question and my publisher was in the audience at the time and uh, um, uh, and, and she had she had said to me uh, any more books I said well um, maybe thinking about it she said I guess the next one will be called droning on will it <laughs> <laughs> have you still got the same publicist yes I do uh, <laughs> But uh, look, I, yes, there are a couple of things. One, one, you know, nothing to do with aviation at all. Um, uh, but I, I do sort of feel well. Look, Rescue Pilot was a was a was a collection of memories that I wanted to write down for the kids before I forgot them. Um, you know, some funny stories, some some more serious stories, and and just recollection of the times and the people. And it took me a long time to do it. I mean, I, I would pick it up and I would beaver at it for a week and then I'd put it down for a year because we'd be off to do something else you know and, and and then I'd go oh I really want to get back to that and I would write another couple of chapters so it took a long time to do that having then been through the process of writing that and by the way the editing and and the, the publishing of it which is all you know the the main part of it frankly I think I've re-read re Rescue Pilot about 45 times, which you have to do with the editor. But anyway, the, the, having been through that process, I was then better equipped when I came to write Film Pilot, which was the sort of second part of the autobiography about the, you know, all of the filming career. And uh, I think I had a better understanding of the structure of a book, um, of how long to make various stories or how short you know how much background was needed or whatever uh so that was a it, it was really written in a way that i hoped that other helicopter pilots would read it and go oh okay you know i do a bit of film work and you know i've learned a few things from this um but in in all honesty i guess yeah hopefully one day there will be a drone book and, and a drone book which um it again enables the new generation to to not have to relearn everything and not not have to reinvent the wheel, because I very often find in the field with 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 young operators that uh, that they're going, oh, well, you know, how do I how do I achieve this? And you go, well, we worked that out about thirty years ago. Um, but shortcut is here's the answer. Uh, and I think that perhaps there is a there is a place for for, for that in a book. At the moment, I'm having too much fun actually doing it rather than uh, rather than writing about it. But uh, I guess I'll get around to it one day. Oh yeah, okay. Drone book. I'm going to come back to that. Okay. <laughs> I want to come back to that. In film pilot. Yeah. You talk about Kuwait. Yeah, yeah. I I read that chapter with much interest, without necessarily giving away the book because we do want people to read the book. But is is there something to do with Kuwait that we could chat about that perhaps isn't in detail in the book, but can enlighten us what it was like when you went to Kuwait? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could talk about Kuwait all day long. Uh, the, the, it, it is one of those of life's experiences that uh, that sits in a little box by itself. You know, they they had. Um, the war had finished in, uh, this is the first Gulf War, had finished in, in I think, about April. And the uh, uh, the director, Werner Herzog, very famous German director who uh, has made some extraordinary films over the years, 
But he uh, had um, been awarded a contract to do a, a, uh, a film about the uh, extinguishing of the fires, the oil fires, where Saddam Hussein had set fire to 750 wells. Um, and there were international teams from everywhere trying to put these things out. Well, the you get there and, you know, the word Armageddon doesn't really cover it. Uh, and Werner couldn't come out for two weeks, so he, he just sent my team there first to, to get what we could both from the air and, and um, from the ground um, because they had started to put them out at a... Uh, a, a remarkable rate, um, and uh, and he really wanted to uh, to capture the images, obviously, of, of what it was like when most of them were going. So uh, um, it was a, a a good time, a good learning curve without the mentor being there. And I had enough experience by then to to be able to effectively direct what was going on. In order to do that. And, and this is kind of the point, really, for it, it's a big point in, in when we're training people to, to film from drones, that you have to be your own editor. Um, there is no good uh, point in handing across to an editor miles and miles of footage uh, and going, well, there you go, make something out of that. You have to film in, in such a way. It might not be, you know, you don't, well, you don't film in, in the order in which it's going to be seen, but you have to have a, a, a sense of how it's going to ultimately fit together. And therefore you need, you know, things that introduce a subject uh, or that are a segue from one subject to another. And that therefore dictates what you're, what you're capturing on film. And you, um, you try and make the editor's life as easy as possible. Um, and, and editors will thank you hugely if you if you do achieve that. But to do so, you have to have um, you know watched an awful lot of uh, of aerial footage to understand what works and what doesn't, uh, and to understand the context in in which it's going to work. And that idea of editing yourself while you're filming uh, is something that stood us in very good uh, stead in Q8. Um, where you know when when Werner Herzog did come out uh, and look at all the rushes, he went, oh yeah, I'm a, you know I've I've pretty much got the film here. I just want to do a few interviews to insert, and and then he went on to teach me something afterwards, which was, I suppose, twofold. One is that you can shoot a thing, assuming how it's going to be used, and then find that it will be used slightly differently which opens up a whole new creative way of doing something. So, for example, he would take a particularly dramatic piece of classical music and simply cut together aerial after aerial after aerial to illustrate the, the horror of that landscape. Uh, it worked incredibly effectively. It's, it's called uh, Lessons of Darkness, and you can still find clips of that on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and it was like no other um, uh, film that I have ever seen. One of the techniques that um, that he used, I had never seen used before or indeed since, and that is that you know I I, I was flying oh, five feet off a uh, off a, uh, a big oil pipeline running across the desert, and it went on and on and on, and. I then was going to stop that shot to move into another shot of a of an oil tank that had that had melted with this with the strength of the fire and it was like a piece of paper origami you know mm. uh, but uh, sometimes when when you're you, when you really are in the zone uh, and it, everything is flowing there's no point in stopping and starting the camera just just flow on into the next shot. And um, uh, uh, and let the editor put the scissors in and you know take out your shadow and um, and make it into two clips. But actually, Herzog um, and as I said, I've never seen this done before. He he used the whole sequence without cut, including our own shadow going through shot, which normally would be a no-no, but uh, but worked really well in in context. So um, 
I, I've had the privilege of, you know, being with uh, with Hollywood actors who who said, "Oh my God, did you do that? That was that's my favourite uh, uh, film of all time." Um, and uh, I think it's still the thing in terms of creating imagery from the air. It's still the the thing that I'm most proud of. Was it an unnerving time for you while you were there? Yes. Um, initially, uh, I I actually think that as humans we're too adaptable, and I think it's quite scary when you talk about things like climate change. Um, but that's a whole other subject. Um, <laughs> but that's uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, no, we are too adaptable. You know, on, on day one, your jaw is hanging open, and you just cannot believe the sights and sounds that you're hearing and seeing. Uh, and by day three, you are ho hum. Uh, another day at work in the burning oil fields, um, and uh, uh, and there's lots of stories that um, we haven't got time for now. But 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 basically about how you you become complacent about it in circumstances where every everybody around you is battling with with you know oil fires at 800 degrees centigrade. Um, you can very quickly become uh, not as safety conscious as you should, and uh, and that was quite a quite a lesson to me as to how quickly we got used to that as being our new environment. I can't imagine what it would have been like, but uh, reading the chapter in the book, it, it it sort of gives you a bit of an insight, and you can sort of start to appreciate the enormity of it all. But um, and obviously, seeing uh, the documentary. Um, help but it, it's one thing to see it and it's another thing to be in it yeah <laughs> very much so now I want to ask you about the IMAX film yeah yeah. tell me about the IMAX film well we, yeah, Sarah and I had, had always had in our heads that one day we would like to make an IMAX film um, we had worked together on um, the Rolling Stones at the Max, which is, uh, I think, the only 90-minute uh, uh, IMAX uh, documentary um, at Wembley in 1992, I think it was. I remember uh, reading that in the book. Yeah, and it, it, whew, the, IMAX, the, the IMAX format, uh, um, I'm sure most people have been to an IMAX film, you know, 10 stories high screen, enormous um, pictures uh, it requires a whole different way of filming and um, uh, anyway the, the the years passed and we always had this in mind and sometimes we'd shot things and gone let's just put that little piece to one side because that could be a part of our IMAX film one day and then uh, in oh, 2013 uh, there was enough time and, and, and opportunity to, to get stuck into doing that. Um, and we, we set ourselves the task of, was it possible to, uh, to make a, a, a film uh, 40 minutes long only from aerials without ever going to the ground? Uh, and it was a fascinating exercise. Uh, the, the imagery we had from places like uh, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, uh, Marysville after uh, uh, after Black Saturday, um, and, and some more positive things around the world. Uh, we had gradually started to cut this together, and 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 then we went, okay, this this works. This is you know going to work on an IMAX screen. Let's do it. Uh, and we did. We went head down for uh, about eighteen months. Um, in ed editing and all of the technical aspects of, of, of putting together an IMAX film. Um, the, uh, the financing of it is not a small thing. Uh, the, even the music track alone was a, was a quarter of a million dollar license. Wow. Um, so, you know, fairly serious money involved in this. Uh, and, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed the, the whole process. And it was a sort of full stop at the end of the, um, the helicopter flying work. Although I didn't know it at the time, but but once we uh, sort of put our head above water, having been working on that for eighteen months, we went, "Hang on a minute, where's all the bread and butter work gone um, that we used to do uh, on a daily basis?" And uh, and the realization that actually it had all gone to drones, and that was really the wake up call for us. Now you mentioned that you might write a drone book. Yeah. 
I think that's a good segue because you've done more than just perhaps having your in your mind a book on the utilization of drones you've actually got a a training course haven't you yes yeah 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 look i i can't look i i, I was motivated to join the navy as a pilot when i was only 13 years old um a guy came to our uh, school and he told us about what he did for a job and it happened that he was a, a naval pilot uh, and I sat there with my jaw open thinking this can't be a job you can't get paid for doing this stuff surely uh, and he was uh, a guy who explained that uh, you know he'd left school he'd gone into a training course and there he was as a naval officer and a pilot uh, and all of the things that he got up to in his day-to-day -day job. And I, I came out of that, you know, sort of 40-minute presentation going, right, I know what I want to be. Uh, and from that moment onwards, I was completely motivated. I knew why I was doing um, maths and physics and geography, and, uh, and I knew why I was ditching various other subjects in, in the favour of that. Um, so it's huge motivation, and... It, sometimes in my in my talks, especially to, to youngsters, I, I still put up his his picture um, as a uh, uh, a motivation to youngsters uh, as to um, uh, the fact that you you can actually have a career doing the thing that you love doing, um, and and I have begun to feel recently that it is. Uh, that I have to give back in some way. That it, that it is a certain obligation to me to uh, sort of hand on some of the things that I've learned. So, uh, yes, that is potentially a motivation for a book. Um, and in the meantime, we're running um, courses, Sarah and I, uh, one-day courses, uh, which we call a masterclass, basically me handing off uh, a few tips and tricks of, uh, of the trade, um, but particularly trying to get people to, to the point where they – where they uh, realise that uh, it is actually possible to um, uh, to forge a career around doing something that you love doing, and uh, and it, it, you know if only if only one person leaves our course and goes on to a career using drones as their primary primary um, uh, employment for coming years, then then I will feel that uh, that I've done my job. But you know. Uh, if they go, if, if even if they go away after uh, our one-day course and, and and they've learnt just a couple of things that improves the way that they film, uh, and gives them motivation to to put good stuff up on uh, on, on Facebook and YouTube rather than the uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been looking at recently. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll feel I've done the job, you know. Jerry, it's been great sitting here chatting with you. It really has. I want to thank you for your time. Well, thank you for inviting me on. And I hope we'll have a few more chats in the future because whilst we've covered a lot of ground, I think we could go back and go a bit deeper into some of those things we've talked about. No, I'd love to. And I, and I must say I'm really looking forward to, uh, to he uh, um, hearing the... Uh, uh, the other interviewees that, that you've got on because um, it's a really interesting and diverse group. And uh, one of the fabulous things about getting into drones after a lifetime in helicopters is uh, uh, I, I may not be back to square one, but I'm certainly uh, learning as, as we go along and, um, uh, and thoroughly enjoying that process. So uh, uh, I'm going to be listening to all of them. Thanks, Jerry. Well, uh, until next time, bye for now. All right. Lovely to talk, Shane. Thanks so much. Cheers. So if you're interested in buying one of Jerry's books, Rescue Pilot, Cheating the Sea, or Film Pilot, From James Bond to Hurricane Katrina, and if you're interested in doing the Fly the Lens course, just visit his website at jerryg.co. And that's Jerry with a J. Well, that's all for this episode. Remember to subscribe to the Drone Chat podcast. Join our Facebook group, Safe Droning Australia, and visit the website, safedroningaustralia.com.au, to sign up for our monthly newsletter, 
UAV news, tips, special deals and details about upcoming podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, happy and safe flying, everyone.